Hello, everyone, and welcome to session three of the uh, Rockworks training class. Uh, it looks like John Barry's just turned on his audio, calling in by phone. Welcome. Uh, we also have Renee Renteria and Chris Strabig uh, logged in, as well as myself. I'm Tom Bresnahan. I've got another one logging in here. We're waiting for the name. And we've got Silas logged in. Welcome to uh, session three of the Rockworks uh, 17 training, web training, where we'll be talking about modeling. Uh, I've got the Rockworks program on the screen. In previous sessions, uh, we talked about data entry, how to get your data into the program. We talked about the uh, layout of the program and uh, the different types of tables that we have available for modeling. Uh, today, we'll finally get into the modeling for your data. I'm running the meeting from home today to meet up with a uh, furnace guy to fix the furnace, so apologies ahead of time if uh, we have to cut things a little short or if we have to have a little pause. I'm expecting him to show up at the end of the meeting, so we're back-to-back -back meetings here, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, previously, we talked about two types of data that I think will be very useful for modeling your boreholes. Your boreholes consisted of a number of different materials. They could be modeled possibly two different ways through lithology, where we just have separate uh, soil or lithology types. In this case, soil, gravel, silt, and gravel. We can have repeated lithologies down hole. And when we create a 3D model with lithology, it's going to be a solid block model, which is great for horizontal beds, um, but for steeply dipping beds, we have some extra steps that we have to take into account. The other method that we have is stratigraphy, and I'll click on the stratigraphy table here. In the stratigraphy table, you may recall when we were setting things up in the types table, we have an order that we have to maintain in our stratigraphic units with no repeats down hole and a consistent order from top to bottom. So A horizon is always on the top, basement is always on the bottom. All these other units are here. In the way we handle missing units is we'll go ahead and put them into their right stratigraphic position but with zero thickness or the same top and bottom depth as we have here for this Leadville limestone. Stratigraphic models are modeled as 2D gridded surfaces and uh, Oh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I saw your comment, Renee, in the chat box. It says, can you show us how to enter SPT data? Um, if you have an example of your data, I'll be happy to show you how to do that, either now or after the session uh, via email. But um, I don't, let me, let's talk about that type of data as well. Uh, so lithology data, no repeats, constant order. Lithology data, repeats down hole modeled as a block model. Two other types of data that we have available are our so-called I data or interval-based data with a top and a base to the interval and our so-called P data representing point data where we have a single point for the data value. We can mix any type of data that you like here in interval data, we can have mixed intervals with uh, some intervals having no data or some data types only having data at a particular interval. That's not a problem. So I'm thinking your SPT data, if you're going to actually create a model with it, then uh, you would choose one of these data types. On the other hand, if you're just making a graphical log where you just want the data to be listed on the log without uh, creating a, a model from your SPT data, then it could be put in as uh, one of these text methods here, interval-based text with no model or point-based text. We have a new uh, member joining us. Janelle has uh, suddenly has joined us. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're talking about different data types in the Rockworks 17 program. We talked briefly about lithology and stratigraphy, interval-based data, and point-based data. So uh, 
Renee, I'm going to defer your question till later, if you, uh, that's okay with you. Um, until we have a, a, a firm example in front of us, uh, then I think that will make the most sense when I see what your data type is and uh, how you want to display it. So let's go in. Uh, let's see. Uh, on this system, I don't have your log in front of me immediately. Let me, I'll do a search offline on the other screen here and see if I can bring up an example with your file. Nothing's coming up immediately. I apologize. Um, we'll have to uh, defer that till later. But let's talk about the different. I'll go ahead and cover lithology modeling, stratigraphy modeling, interval-based modeling, and point-based modeling, which what we'll see, interval and point data are, are two additional types of data that are modeled as a block model. <laughs> Let's start out with stratigraphy. We have uh, different stratigraphic horizons at a constant order. You can see as I click on the different boreholes, uh, the distribution of some of my, the, my formations in these boreholes. You can see here's a quick map that shows my distribution of boreholes with uh, these uh, black and red lines representing non-vertical boreholes. Probably not something you'll have to worry about. You'll probably just have all your points here. So that's the distribution of data. If we go into the stratigraphy menu here at the top at the borehole manager and we choose model, what we will do is model all the formations in our stratigraphy types one at a time, either from top to bottom, bottom to top, or in uh, without any particular preference. So we've opened up the secondary menu uh, for stratigraphy modeling and the main Rockworks windows in the background. Str if we can expand these menu items by hitting these little plus or minimize them with a little minus sign here. We're going to include all our stratigraphic units in the model by default, but you could certainly choose particular units if you want to exclude some. For instance, uh, with a str stratigraphy model, we need at least three data points to create a surface. So if you have a unit that hasn't been sampled or is not present in more than th three or more boreholes, then you might want to exclude it for, from the model for the time being. When we're ready to do a model, we add a check mark to this checkbox for interpolate surfaces. Then we click on the options button to get the dialog box for our different stratigraphic modeling options. So I'll do a quick run through of all of these uh, types. With the main, the main thing we'll get out of this is that we'll probably be dealing mainly with inverse distance and creaking to make these gridded models. Now these gridded models are two, what we would call 2D models. We can display them in 3D, but they're called 2D models because they're only based on the X and Y location and a particular elevation for each formation at that location. So the 2D gridded surfaces is what we'll be creating with, the, with this gridding uh, method when we're doing stratigraphic modeling. But for completeness, in case you're wondering, we have a number of other methods we can use where closest point is just, what's the nearest point? I'll take that. Uh, good for classification type modeling, not for stratigraphy. Here's the one that, a cumulative method that adds all the points within the grid nodes, add all, adds all the values to get a cumulative value. A dip method here uses uh, surface dips to uh, aid in constructing the model. The directional method lets you add a directional uh, weighting or bias so that you can see from the little cartoons here, if you're following along on another computer or another screen rather, that we can have a strong bias, say in the 45 direction, 45 degree direction or northeast. The distance to point method creates a grid that shows the number of bullseyes that are contoured on the distance to the nearest control point. This is a good grid to use for uh, filtering our other uh, results by a particular distance. 
Again, here's our main, one of our two main gridding methods, inverse distance. Uh, inverse distance is weighted to a power. By default, it's inverse distance squared. So as this weighting exponent gets bigger, the weight of distant points gets smaller because it's an inverse relationship. Typically, we just pick eight nearest points, but we can do some other fancy things with inverse distance, such as look in different sectors to find out where to pick our data points to give us a, a smoother model. We can have a cutoff distance when we that's built into this section here, where we can say uh, go out no further than 15% of the project dimensions or 200 meters away, uh, cut things off automatically. Typically, we start out without any of these fancy things turned on. In my opinion, we just do a basic gridding model and see how the model looks. Note up here we have an icon for instructional videos. If I click on this, an instructional video will open up in YouTube. OK, let's take a look at the next method, Krieging. Krieging is also a distance weighting method, but in this case, we can build a uh, a variogram model, which is a model of uh, variance versus the distance between each pair of points. When we create this kind of a model, we get a tend to get a smoother looking surface with isolated highs joined into ridges and uh, individual lows joined as valleys. We'll contrast that with the inverse distance method where uh, this has a tendency to produce bullseyes around highs and lows. Another grading method that we have is a planar method where we just uh, construct a, uh, a first order polynomial planar surface. Uh, based on our data points, uh, has some limited appeal based on uh, maybe uh, other types of models, say groundwater surfaces, uh, not something we'll be looking at for stratigraphy. Sample density gives us an idea of how many sample points we have per cell, again, to quantify our data a little bit. This trend polynomial and trend residuals methods create a polynomial fit to our data. Uh, this, again, could work well with um, groundwater surfaces, but of course, if we're fitting a polynomial equation to the data, there'll be a tendency for some of the data points to not fit the equation exactly. We can also calculate the residuals or the difference between the polynomial uh, fit and the actual data points and grid that separately. Uh, Typically, I don't expect we'll be using those methods for stratigraphy modeling, but you may be using them for some other types of models. So we're covering them while we're on the option of gridding. One other method that may be of interest to you is triangulation. And you can see from the cartoon here on the right that we draw a series of triangles between all our data points. And this series of triangles will be generated the same each time with this uh, so that if there's any question about which points to connect in a triangle. And so we'll use those triangles to determine what's happening uh, in between those points. And we'll calculate a value at each grid node based on where it lies within that triangle. Under hybrid, we have uh, the option to combine multiple methods with different weighting powers. In this example, I'm combining inverse distance and Krieging and giving them an equal weight so that I'm trying to, I might possibly be trying to mitigate some of the bullseyes created with inverse distance, but also by adding in a little bit of Krieging. So in order to do a hybrid method, be sure you turn on the method and then make your selections here. But let's stay in inverse distance for now. Um, inverse distance, the, those bullseyes will be most apparent when we make a contour map. If we're only looking at 3D surfaces, the bullseyes are not as obvious. OK, we've gone through all the uh, different gridding algorithms. Let's jump over to this right-hand pane on the right where we have additional options. Again, we talked about this, I think, in each of the previous sessions. When, 
we're making a grid we need to uh, define the grid dimensions so let's take a look at what grid dimensions we have for this particular data set uh, these were calculated by scanning all the boreholes, and so uh, we've rounded the numbers off to have a nice even number here for the min and max. If we're combining grids with solid models or adding or subtracting two grids together, they'll all need to have the same minimum and maximum X and Y value and the same spacing. So for grids, we're only looking at X and Y dimensions, and think of it as this top layer in this solid depiction of our project dimensions. If we were making a solid model for lithology, then we'd be calculating values for each of these blocks in a 3D solid model using this spacing definition and the min and max. Notice here in gray we have the number of nodes. This is calculated from our spacing and XY extents. Uh, their extents cover 300 meters, so a 5-meter spacing will give us 61 nodes. We get that extra node uh, at the uh, beginning or end of that range between these two values. Uh, so this is where we would control our spacing. Typically, we just keep our spacing based on our output dimensions defined on a previous screen. I can't get to it until I close this dialog box, but I'll show you that when we finish here in, with this one. Uh, there's also options to do variable uh, extents and spacing based on the data coordinates. If we do choose that for a stratigraphic model, then we won't be able to combine the grids easily because they need that same X, Y, min and max, and same X and Y space. The X spacing has to be the same throughout, and the Y spacing has to be the same throughout to make that clear. The X spacing does not have to equal the Y spacing. You do not have to have square grid nodes, but it makes usually makes the most amount of sense to have those the same. Our next option uh, down here under stratigraphic modeling is declustering. This can happen when we have multiple points in a cell. We'll calculate either the average or the closest to the center of that cell node and use that for gridding. With your data distribution, I don't think you have enough data to worry about the clustering. I would turn that off by default. Another option that we have listed here is the logarithmic method. With this method, we take the log of all the values that we're gridding, make a grid out of that, and then calculate the anti-log back. As you can see from the example, uh, we have a big spike here in this particular data set. This would be more likely to happen with some kind of surface contamination where it drops off rapidly and we have we, and our data cover several orders of magnitude. That's not happening with strateg stratigraphy modeling, so we don't need to worry about it for this particular application. Our next option here is the high fidelity option. With this option, some of the gridding methods don't match the data points exactly by design, especially when we're doing something like a, a polynomial fit surface to it. By selecting the high fidelity method, we'll add in any differences between the calculated grid and the actual data value and put them into the new grid model. So this can result in a few more bumps and dimples to the model, but it honors our data points exactly. So that, again, this is something that's more important when we're making a contour map. This poly enhanced method is yet another polynomial calculation that we can use where we'll calculate a polynomial fit to the data points and then with the residuals we'll grid those separately and add them into the polynomial fit. So it's kind of a, one of these blended methods. If you think the data fit a polynomial you might pick a first or second order polynomial or maybe even the third order to fit your data. We don't usually recommend going to these higher order polynomials. Uh, it, you tend to get uh, a lot of um, model blowout or uh, areas between data points where it's trying to add those additional orders to the fit. Not a good idea in most cases. Let's take a look at the next uh, gridding option here called smoothing, where 
we can use either a distance weighted average or a lowest or highest value within a filter size. With a filter size of one, we're doing a moving weighted average between all the cells. There are one cell out from the current cell. We can repeat the several passes, and that's what the iterations will control. By smoothing, this is kind of the enemy of high fidelity, where smoothing tends to smooth out those rough edges, high fidelity tends to add them in if our gridding method is not honoring them. Typically, I don't think we start out with smoothing by default. I don't, anyway, because uh, smoothing is adding more processing to my grid model. If I need smoothing because the model comes out a little bit angular or rough, then sure, go ahead and add it in later. But to start out, I don't think we need to start with smoothing. Densify is a method where additional data points are added using triangulation, and then that those new data points are added to our data set and gridded with the method chosen over here, like inverse or distance or Krieging. Not something I would start with, but it might help you create a better model where if you have an area where there are fewer data points. Max distance is the next option that I have listed under stratigraphic modeling. With this uh, particular one, we can only define a cutoff distance based as a percentage of our project dimensions. We can't do it by units at this location. Um, you can see uh, with the option, with the example on the left, no filtering will grid the entire area. And in this data in case, we have no data up here in the northwest corner. If we start turning on distance filtering, we get these uh, bullseyes or crop circles where the uh, model only goes out a certain distance. If we cho if we chosen a small cutoff distance like 5%, it's not unusual at all to get gaps between our data points. Because then we would just go in and recalculate the grid with a higher cutoff distance. Again, I don't think it's something we start out with, but it's there if we need it to refine our model. We have another option to actually grid when our data are based on actual colors, uh, typically used by the clay people for tile or ceramics, uh, not something we, that applies to stratigraphic modeling. Another option here, though, under our additional options for stratigraphic modeling is faulting. When you have the advanced version of RockWorks, you can define either 2D or 3D faults. And these faults are, we're not defining actual offset with these faults, but we're defining either a linear feature or a, or a so-called 3D fault ribbon that acts as a barrier to gridding. So say we have data in this particular area, we don't want it to be affected as much by this particular area, then we have these linear features that we can define on a map, save to a fault table, and then use that fault when we're creating our model. So this definitely creates discontinuities in your map as faulting does, but uh, we're, the actual mechanism by which we do that is by putting up a fence or a barrier so that we get some discontinuous nature to the gridding. So anything, any grid nodes over here in the southwest corner won't be seeing as much of an influence by this data if it has to cross one of these line boundaries. Okay, so that's, that's a quick run through of our gridding options here and additional options. Let's keep going. We've got a number of other options that we have when we create our model. And the next one that I'd like to talk about is the modeling sequence. I'll click on that tab here. And in the modeling sequence, remember for stratigraphy, we're going to enforce a particular order to our stratigraphic units. In so doing, if we just created a number of grids for each of those stratigraphic units without any, any reference to the overlying and underlying units, you might get two types of problems overlaps where the base of this brown unit is projected down and overlapping this white unit, or we might get gaps where uh, between two units, we're not getting them actually touching. So to try to fix this problem, we have a couple of different methods we can use for 
our modeling sequence. The default is to use base to top uh, order of modeling, where we'll start out gridding the underlying units first, then we'll create grids for the top and base of the next overlying unit, and if the units overlap, then the underlying unit will take precedence. So in this case, we can see that uh, rather than getting this uh, overlap of this brown unit coming down here, uh, the underlying unit was defined straight across here, and it prevented that uh, overlying unit from sagging down and crossing the, the underlying unit. By the same token, there was there's a gap here in this particular borehole between what was sampled for the yellow unit and the blue unit. And so after the blue unit is defined, uh, the top of the blue unit is set equal to the base of the yellow unit where they don't over where they don't coincide exactly. So that's our base to top order or sort of bottom up as uh, as far as the order goes. A new, uh, another option that we have is a top-down or top-to-base order, where we start out gridding the upper units first, and then once we have those defined, if there are any gaps or overlaps, the uppermost units take precedence. So these two models, these two methods will give us two different types of models. You can see this lower, uh, this brown unit is sagging down. It's taking precedence over this white unit that normally would be projected from point to point here. So which one do we start out with? Well, it's trial and error. And it's everybody's data are different. Everybody's data distribution is different. Uh, sometimes you have more shallow control, so you want to go from a top-down approach. Sometimes you have a geologic setting, like a valley fill, where there's an underlying basal unit that gets filled up with uh, younger units that are missing outside the valley, then we want that underlying unit to take precedence. So I would start with uh, probably a base to top and then uh, make some cross sections to see how things come out. A few more options that we have for our stratigraphic modeling. There's quite a few, so bear with me. Let's go down to the next option here called constraining surface. And what this option has, if it's turned on with a little check mark here, would be to truncate units above an existing ground surface. If I had already gridded the ground surface, say with a DEM, or just using the elevation data from my boreholes, and for some reason the topmost units weren't coinciding with that ground surface, again, this tries to give us a little bit of control so we don't have any of our stratigraphy extending above another gridded surface, in this case, the ground. Very few rocks float above the ground, so a good choice to have. One thing I would caution, though, is to think about do we want to replace that uppermost surface with the ground surface? Typically, we say, sure, we want those to be conforming or conformal and coincident. But I've seen an example where uh, boreholes, uh, there was a particular unit that was non-existent at the surface by replacing that the top of that non-existent unit with the ground surface, we created some artifacts in uh, that particular unit having a thickness where it should not have one. So I'd, I'd leave this on by default, but if it causes problems, then be sure to go in here and try it with that option turned off. In the example in the dialog box in this cartoon, we start out with a gridded surface over the entire area. You can see it's uh, undulating, so it's already been constrained by a particular uh, surface, but our, our new ground surface might represent uh, the digging of a pit. Um, if we super, if we make that the new constraining surface, then the new model can be defined uh, so that it doesn't extend above this new pit surface. Or we can also extract only the area above that excavated surface, so we can get a volumetric of what was ex excavated. Another type of filter that we can use when we're making a grid model, and, and th which is used definitely for stratigraphy, is the polygon filter. This polygon filter is the so-called uh, cookie cutter filter, where we have a polygon that 
defines an irregular outer boundary in 2D, and uh, we can truncate the surface and uh, know uh, any values either outside of that polygon or, in this case, on the left, inside of the polygon. So um, uh, for whatever reason, you may not want the model to extend inside of a polygon. You could truncate it with this polygon filter. Or you might say, no, I don't want to set any distance filters. I just want to truncate it based on the, this particular uh, property boundary. We can uh, truncate it outside the uh, polygon as well. And again, this is something that we can define within the uh, a 2D map. We can either draw a polygon or import one and then uh, save it to a, a polygon table and use it as a filter. Two more options that we have listed in this uh, stratigraphic modeling options dialog box are the so-called base plate option. If our units, if our bottommost stratigraphic unit, say, is called basement, uh, there's very few boreholes that will go to the base of that unit. So we can just put in an artificial pointer surface at the bottom of our model to fill that up when we make cross sections. The last option here is volumetrics. When we do create a gridded model, as shown here on the right, we can also calculate volumetrics on the fly. And the way we'll do that is we'll take the uh, thickness between the top and base of uh, any unit, and we know the grid, the area of each of the grid cells in this model, so we multiply the area times the thickness to get a volume. It slows things down a little bit, not too bad. If you're, you were doing a lot of units and had a very finely spaced model, this could be a little bit more time consuming. I would leave this off for now and uh, turn it back on as we need it. Okay, so we've gone through all the options for interpolating our surfaces. Uh, let's take a quick, I'll take, I will finish up here and then I'll talk a little bit about how we could get some of those polygon filters or fault uh, lines into our uh, database to use as part of our filtering. But before we get there, let's take a look at the other options in the strateg stratigraphy model menu. Again, chosen from the stratigraphy menu on the main window. Maximize that for room. One of the options is to save a numeric model. Even though stratigraphic models consist of gridded surfaces, we could save that to a solid model where we would fill in all the areas between the top and base of a unit with a value for that unit. The last option here is uh, diagram. So when we create a model, we probably want to see how it came out. So we can turn on the diagram options for making a, a 3D model. The first option is, do we want to plot faults? Here's an example of a fault ribbon here on the right that's in 3D, or we can just plot 2D polylines on top of our surfaces, or we could plot 2, 2D vertical panels extending down vertically throughout the entire model. Another option here is the explode option, where we just uh, offset our various stratigraphic surfaces for clarity so we can see where the thin zones are. Um, remember, I was saying, even if you have a missing unit, we usually put in where that unit exists in order, but with zero thickness or the same top and base, normally we don't want to display that unit when it's thin, so we can put in a thickness cutoff. And so this upper blue unit, you can see, has been nulled out where it fell below a thickness cutoff. By default, the thickness cutoff is a very small number. In real life, we'd probably set this to a higher value, say, one or two meters, if we're working in meters. Uh, plot logs is another option that we have where we can clip our logs if they extend way beyond our model. Probably not the case for what you're working with. Reference cage is it plots a rectangular series of lines and grids to define, uh, kind of orient us in 3D space. And there's a number of options that we have here for the tick marks and panel colors, etc. 
then lastly, we can add a stratigraphic legend on the fly to our model. So let's OK out of that and go ahead and process our model. I'll click on the process button and you can see we're going through creating gridded surfaces for each of our stratigraphic formations that exist in the model. So let's move this off for a minute. Again, in the stratigraphy types, we had five different units. Close that. Let's bring our model back here. So from those, we did get these three, uh, five different gridded surfaces, excuse me. And this is opening up in a so-called Rockpot 3D window where we can click on the model and drag the mouse to change its orientation. Uh, we do have a, some options here. Getting the hang of get, getting these displayed correctly can be a little bit problematic at first. If we get all turned around, we can always go to the view menu above and southeast. And this is our default view for our gridded model. If we click over here on the side, this is what I call our object manager, where uh, we can't actually click on a surface and, and do too much with it, but we can break it down into its pieces by open, expanding out the uh, various components of the stratigraphy model. These stylized letter Gs in green here are ju just a, a grouping of different elements. So I'm expanding out the A horizon here. If I uh, remove the check mark, I'm removing the A horizon completely. I can also control just the top base and sides in the, my display. So I can, this is good if we're just uh, clicking down through our surfaces to see what exists. In this particular example, I know that the Leadville formation is pinching out uh, approximately in the middle of the model from north to south. I didn't turn on that hide thin zones to show you what happens with that pinch out that those top and basal surfaces exist and are coexistent where it's zero thickness if we've created a good model. So this might be a point where I would step back into my options. I've already interpolated my surfaces, so I can just reuse those when I redraw the diagram, go into the diagram options, choose the option to hide thin zones, and I'll really, I'll pump it up to, uh, let's, let's try two meters, okay. Let's make a new model. And it will redraw the entire model. So I'll have to come in here. You can see the A horizon has some pinch outs as well where it's not present. Let's go down to the Leadville and you can see I've done a fairly good job of, of showing that uh, zero thickness but I have some work to do over here where s some additional thickness was calculated based on those top and basal surfaces. I can go in as well and get turn on our logs and if we turn the logs on we can define what tracks do we want to display? I'll turn on stratigraphy and I'll reprocess the diagram without calculating the model again. So here's my same model and, and let's go up to a plan view. We can see all the boreholes and what's crop, what's the uh, topmost formation in each of these. I'll turn off the model real quick to make those more apparent. The boreholes are shown as cylinders, and we can see the, the light blue Leadville limestone here is indeed pinching out. So let's go back to that problematic area for the Leadville. It's showing some Leadville reappearing in this particular borehole, so I might want to go into that borehole. We'll turn off the next formation to Potosi. We'll turn off the Leadville on and off. That particular borehole doesn't have any Leadville present in it. We might go back to the data at this point and see if we've added a zero thickness point to that particular borehole. We can zoom in here and see which borehole it is. It's number 38. This is a good way to uh, QA your models in, in 3D and see what's going on. I'll drag this off to the side. I'll leave a little bit present so you can see I'm working with it. It's borehole 38, and you can see indeed the uh, Leadville was not 
given a zero thickness in here without that zero thickness to tie down those surfaces. Uh, data from nearby boreholes was uh, extrapolated into that area and we, we got a little bit of a blip. So I would go in to Leadville, it's between Spurgeon and Potosi. To fix that, I would put in a new unit here that's at 31.1. This is the Leadville. Oh, trap down. And then after I'm finished, you can see I've inserted a zero thickness unit here. I could go in and recalculate the model. So that's how stratigraphy modeling looks in 3D. And oh, I was going to also illustrate the sides of the Leadville limestone. If we uh, turn off the side of the Leadville, we, we can see through that uh, panel that we've drawn between the top and basal units to see some of our logs in here. In addition, for the stratigraphy model, I can double click on that and look at the options, which popped up off screen. I can also control the opacity of the entire model. With 50%, it's a little bit too vague, maybe 80% be a good choice close that and I believe let's take a look here individual units can have their opacities set uh, between zero and a hundred percent as well so that's that demo in 3d for the stratigraphy model we can save this uh, particular model to a rockpot 3d file I'll click on the save button and uh, let's see where that has appeared. One moment. Let's see if we can find it. I have a lot of other uh, things going on here, so I'm having trouble finding that. Let's try. F uh, oh, here we go. Sorry, <laughs> it popped up on another screen. I hit the save icon here, or file save in the menu. And I can call it uh, stratigraphy. Uh, with logs we'll call it and save it and then I, if I have another type of a model that I want to display I can append it into this particular model with the file append will prompt me for what other rock where rock works 3d type of file do we want to append okay so we've looked at it in 3d so we can go ahead and close that out Let's take a look at uh, our stratigraphy models in 2D as well, because I think the contour maps are definitely a lot, lot more quantitative than 3D. So before we go there, I did have a point to make. When we gridded uh, all those uh, stratigraphy units, A, Horizon, Spurgeon, Leadville, etc., those are saved as RW grid files, and the only way that Rockworks knows they're in a model is with this naming convention. Uh, the formation name underscore top and formation name underscore base are the grid files that are contained within a model. So we can go ahead and, and if we don't like the way a particular horizon came out with our automatic methods that we use for stratigraphy modeling, we can go into the stratigraphy menu and choose to do just a single gridded surface uh, at any given time. So say I wanted to redo the A horizon, I'll go in here, click to the right and choose a, a name, uh, A dash horizon, uh, Tom for instance, where, so this one won't be included by default when I do anything with stratigraphy modeling, but it'll let me do the same types of gridding that I did previously with the, just a single unit. So I'll save that. You'll see it appends the RW grid uh, extension by default. We're just going to do the top of that A horizon. Same gridding methods that popped up when we were doing the entire stratigraphy model. And now our options are going to be uh, for a 2D map. And to review, we looked at some of these earlier when we were making some borehole location maps, I believe in session one. So we could add a background image. 
um, that will work fine unless we're filling in the contours then we have to work with our opacity borehole locations that makes sense for plotting symbols again symbol size is going to be a function uh, a percentage of the project dimensions 2% works well for uh, displaying on screen. 1% might work better if you have more than 50 boreholes and you're making an actual map. Log traces would be if the uh, total depth location is at a different location than the surface for a non-vertical hole. Borehole IDs, we can add a prefix and suffix and all these other labels that we can add to the program. We could add uh, ground elevations to make sure that our, there's not a bust in the data there. We could add in stratigraphy. We could post the depth of the formation, or if we're trying to see uh, if we have a good model, we could plot the actual top um, elevation calculated as the ground elevation minus the depth that it occurred at. We can add a prefix I, or not. I just typically turn those off because uh, the map gets pretty cluttered, but it could be useful if we were plotting lots of different types of labels. Let's choose, go back to our label options now, which will apply to all these options here, uh, the bottom one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, nine different types of labels. We can draw a box around it with a fill, and then closing rectangle, a line. We can automatically offset our labels if they overlap, I'll turn that off for now, just so we can see what happens with it. We, we can draw contour lines with a regular interval or a custom interval that we can specify uh, from, from a, a, a table or just manually say the major and minor intervals. By major and minor, I mean uh, we can have separate uh, line styles and labels on the major interval, maybe make them a little bit thicker, and then at the minor interval, we could have those uh, a lighter color. So think of major interval as your index contour and minor interval being the contours between the major. When we can label the contours at a particular size and spacing with a number of other options and colors. Let's jump down now to the colored intervals where we can fill the area between contours with color. By default, we have this scheme with two colors, a, 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 a two endpoints, and we'll fill in the uh, rainbow gradient between those two endpoints. We could also do it with three where we need it if we want to add another central uh, anchor point or logical is just true false, custom, we could have a table that defines our colors, say benzene. Let's take a look at that one, for instance, where it doesn't have to be a regular interval. We can see for this contaminant, we're going 0 to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 5, more of a logarithmic interval. This would lock down our colors to particular values. By default, when the program is filling in this uh, two color min max, it's just going to take the minimum and maximum value and fill it in, uh, spread this color range throughout that uh, min max range. Uh, let's skip the other methods for now. Um, our contours for stratigraphy are going to be based on uh, values that are gradational, so we, uh, if they weren't, we could use the classification scheme, but they are, it's going to be a, a contour banding method. The confirm option gives us the choice to change the min and max and interval, not min max, but the interval of our major and minor contours. This is a good way to make sure that the calculated grid uh, has reasonable values. We can omit highs and lows and have a legend. There's a number of other options here. Uh, fault polylines would plot those lines in 2D. Labeled cells would put in numbers for each of those cells. Good way to uh, uh, check the quality of our model. Overlay lets us stack additional diagrams that we've created into layers. 
border lets us specify a number of different border options and send the annotations for the so-called scale bars here with the numerical values, uh, titles, and a box around the whole thing. So those are the, our 2D diagram options. If we go ahead and hit process, you, get, you see we're being uh, prompted to confirm our co color interval. We'll leave it as one meter because we're only covering an, uh, an extent from uh, 1752 to 1768. Say OK. So you can see our labels came out pretty big and they're over plotting each other. And this is normal to go back in. Let's change some of those label options under borehole locations. I'll turn off elevations. I'll turn off stratigraphy for now. Say OK and reprocess. Again, prompted for the interval. Here's a cleaner looking map showing our boreholes and the calculated values for the A horizon. These two labels are over plotting. So let's jump in another time and turn on that option under our labels to automatically offset them if they over plot. OK, process that, confirm that interval. So now the program has moved those two lab labels so they don't land on top of each other. So that's a, just a quick look at uh, some of the things you can do for stratigraphy modeling, where these contours are based on the actual elevations of the particular con uh, formations in our stratigraphy types table. So uh, just to uh, recap a little bit from previous sessions, this contour map has a series of layers. If things start getting too complicated, we can certainly turn off some of the options here for contours and symbols and labels uh, just to declutter the map and look at the underlying data. So all these layers are grouped together, particular elements make it easier to control what's going on on our map. If we decided to go and make some changes to this map manually, uh, say for instance we want to draw a polygon or a fault on here, we can use the drawing tools. We'll start with polyline for faults. Let's say we know that there's a fault right in through here where, these, uh, where the gradient is a little bit thicker. So I'll draw a fault here. I'm in drawing mode. I'll exit that mode. Now if I click on this line, I've selected it, I can right click and save it to a fault table. I'll be prompted to give it a name and it's saved into the fault table within the Rockport, the project database. Now I can specify that fault when I want to make my uh, subsequent models. By the same token, let's go into the draw menu and choose polygon. So I can go in and draw a polygon, close polygon for a particular area. Double click closes the polygon. I can click on this arrow up here to exit drawing mode. Double click to change that fill so we can or change the opacity of that fill. I'll try 50. Apply that. Close so we can see through that polygon. Now I can right click save that to a polygon table just like I did with the faults. Once I say OK, now that polygon is saved into the database and I can call on it to make my next model, say blanking all the area outside that polygon or blanking out or nulling out the area inside that polygon. So that's our 2D uh, uh, modeling for stratigraphy. I'll close this without saving. I can recreate it later. Uh, there's uh, one other display I was going to emphasize uh, for gridding when I contrast that with solid modeling. So let's go to our 3D diagram that I saved and I had a stratigraphy with logs. Let's open that back up in a separate window which popped outside of the screen. Let's drag it back on screen here. Here's a couple of our surfaces here drawn as continuous surfaces. Just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to turn off my other surfaces for basement, for instance, and sides and base. Now we just have that top 
Let's turn off the logs too, just to make things really clear. Here's our Leadville surface. You can see it's a 3D surface. We can control the display of that surface oops, by double clicking on the grid and it's popped off screen. Let's drag it back over. Instead of drawing it as a solid grid, we could draw it. Uh, it this is the one I'm looking for here is a wireframe. If we apply that, now you can see, let's close that. And uh, I think it's popped under. <laughs> here we go. Now you can see that gridded surface is actually a wire mesh here drawn around each of the grid cells. So this is stratigraphy modeling. This is a gridded surface. It's a 2D grid for the top and base of each of our formations. Now let's go into 3D solid modeling and we'll start out with lithology. How are we doing on time? Okay, first hour through. So far so good. I think we're right on schedule. Lithology modeling is when we create a lithology model by going to the lithology menu up here and choosing model. Instead of a gridded surface, we're going to get a 3D solid model. And this model, uh, let's take a look at in my modeling settings if I have a graphic that I'm looking for. It's not clear from this example. Let's back up. But uh, what I'm looking for is something that really emphasizes the nature of this model. So what we'll do is we'll create a new model, we'll give it a name, it's lithology, we'll click on the options and we'll get a whole series of options just like we did for 2D grid but now it's going to be referring to this 3D solid model. If we look at it, uh, if we just look at this diagram with the model dimensions, again, we want these X, Y, min, max, and spacing to match our grids in case we want to do some combinations where, say, we're truncating the upper surface based on a particular formation or the ground surface. So each of these blocks here that's defined here in, in this rectangular solid will be given a separate color based on its lithology. And you may recall, let's close this a minute so I can uh, go back to lithology types table. Lithology has a so-called G value here instead of an order. Since we can have repeated uh, lithologic units down hole, in, uh, let's see if this particular borehole doesn't have it. Let's close that and go back to borehole one. I have repeated gravel units here, no particular order. In this case, the G value for lithology is just a numerical value, and it's used as a classification scheme. So when I create a model, the only values in my model will be the values in my G, in my lithology types table here, or a null value. So there's no interpolation between values. If I have a borehole with uh, sand and another one with shale halfway in between, I'm not going to get some kind of mixed numerical value of sandy shale or something else. It's going to be a classification scheme where it's either a sand or a shale and nothing in between. The numerical values that I assigned for my lithologies happen to be grouped here in a way that will make it easy to filter them. Uh, in this particular case, I wanted to f uh, combine sand and gravel when I'm doing volumetrics when I display in 3D. So I've given them sort of adjacent numerical values here. So I can say throw out everything greater than five and less than four and it will only show me my sand and gravel units and not the other units. I can use decimal values in here for sub subunits. Uh, say if I wanted to get more descriptive and use uh, shaley sand, clay sand, silty sand, etc. I might call all my sands 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and that would help group all my sands together. But we're just going to keep it simple for this example. I think you'll be doing that as well in for, for your type of data. Okay, 
So back in the lithology modeling, when we look at our options, for a lithology model, there's a lot fewer options for our model. And by default, we have something that we're calling lateral extrusion. We'll probably be using either that method or lateral blending to create our solid model. I'll start, let's start with closest point. That might be the easiest method to understand. Uh, closest point has no uh, directional weighting between horizontal and vertical. It just takes the nearest point and assigns a value to that point in this particular area. We tend to see a lot more uh, stratified units when we're doing lithology modeling. So if you feel like there is a horizontal weighting to your units, so if you have a red unit in this borehole and a red unit in this one, and you, you feel those are more related than the underlying purple units when creating our model, then lateral extrusion and lateral blending might be good choices for your model. So what we do is uh, if we have differing units between boreholes, if we take a look at this, uh, let's see, what's a good one here? Let's look at this yellow inner bed here in this borehole, and it's not present in the next one over to the right. The program will just extrude that unit halfway out to the distance between those two boreholes and then abruptly change to the next lithologic unit in the model. For using blending, we're only going a third of the way out between the boreholes, and in the middle, we're randomizing that pick uh, between uh, runs of the model to give us more of an interfingering or a, a feathered effect to that contact, so it's not quite as blocky. And the thickness of those individual fingers here is determined by our project dimensions. So if we take a quick look, you can see we have a one meter spacing vertically uh, for this particular model. So these particular fingers will never get any thinner than one meter because that's the resolution we've defined for our model. If you have units that are thinner than that, that you want to define in your model, then you will need to go in here and define a smaller spacing than one meter. If you have a half meter unit you want to define, at a minimum, specify spacing of half a meter. And in fact, we recommend going down half again to a quarter meter so you get half the thickness uh, of the unit that you want to define. However, if we start putting in a very fine thickness here, like a quarter of a meter, you can see the number of nodes jumps up rapidly. So uh, instead of being 160 nodes vertically, it's now 480. So we're going to calculate this upper gridded surface, 61 by 61, and do that 481 times as we go down through the model. So you can see these solid models tend to be a little bit more larger, take more memory, slower to draw, and uh, uh, could be a little more time consuming as well. I'll go back to my one meter spacing for now for uh, to speed things up. Uh, we also have a fourth method here called highest probability, where the program calculates the probability of each unit at each particular borehole, and then it assigns a value to that uh, um, voxel or 3D pixel unit based on the highest probability. A lot more time consuming, uh, something to mess around with possibly, but I don't think you'll need it typically. Under our additional options here on the right, we have the project dimensions that we looked at. We have the option to decluster. I'm turning mine off because uh, I think your project will not have uh, clustered boreholes. That if you have several boreholes within a particular cell, it's possible that all those boreholes won't be honored because you only get one value per cell. And declustering kind of tends to emphasize that by kind of doing a pre-filter on that cell and grouping all those boreholes into a single value. If you've got several boreholes within a particular cell, then that's telling me that I need a smaller cell spacing because I've got, there's no way I have the resolution to represent all that data. But for a quick look, maybe it would be valuable to have a, a, a coarse spacing and then reprocess it with a finer resolution. 
The add points method lets us add additional points from the data sheet in Rockworks. It could represent uh, surface outcrops, uh, uh, additional information that's not represented by boreholes. Again, we have a logarithmic method, probably not applicable here. We do have smoothing, so that if your model comes up pretty jagged, and that is a tendency, since we're dealing with these 3D voxel elements, or these 3D pixels uh, in our model, like Lego bricks or Minecraft blocks, then uh, by definition, things are going to look blocky. Sometimes smoothing will help uh, smooth out those edges, at the expense of running through a number of passes on the filter, smoothing filter to make it smoother. I turn it off on my first uh, pass to see if, that, if I can get away without it. Distance cutoffs or filtering are the next option here. Again, we can specify a percentage or Luckily, in this case, we can specify map units, uh, so we can cut everything off that's more than 100 meters away from a borehole. Uh, if I want that to take effect, I do need to have a checkbox mark in this checkbox, otherwise uh, we won't be using that. Polygon filtering is similar to the stratigraphy model, where I can do a cookie cutter uh, filter with inside or outside that polygon. And now we have some additional filters that we can apply, and these make sense. Our so-called superface or top surface filter is automatically set to surface to filter the gridded, our lithology model, based on surface elevations within the borehole. You may have a DEM that has higher resolution than your borehole elevations, all means we can use that however if we're going to combine that with this model we might have to resample that in order to get it to the same xy limits and the same model spacing and i'll make a quick note to come back to uh, that resampling and dem after we get through this dialog box uh, the subface filter is turned off by default, so it's by default the model will go all the way to the bottom of our project dimensions. However, we can cut it off with a grid. The automatic method cuts it off at the total depths of all of our boreholes so that we're not trying to calculate a model below the depths of our boreholes makes sense unless you have a big mix of shallow and deep boreholes and then you'll get a very uh, irregular surface to that. We can also use specify a particular grid uh, that we may have created from uh, some other type of data that would truncate our, our model. Uh, you may remember I said previously that the, the uh, lithology model has a strong horizontal weighting. I won't, I, I won't mention the word bias, but I would never use it in court. I'll just call it weighting, where the uh, points that are on the same horizontal um, plane will be more cr connected together, and points in the vertical distance are, will be more disparate. And that's, I think, something we typically see downhole in our boreholes. However, when it comes to uh, an actual area where the entire uh, depositional model is tilted, and if there's regional dip, we can use this tilting option if we turn it on and specify a dip direction and angle so that we'll tilt that horizontal weighting in a particular direction. By the same token, we can use the warping uh, grid or option where we specify a gridded surface and take instead of flat planar horizontal weighting, we can make the weighting conform to a particular gridded surface, say uh, some kind of a structural uh, uh, fabric to our, our depositional environment if that exists. But to start out with, uh, we'll turn that off and see how what kind of a model we'll get with just horizontal weighting. Another option here is faulting. And we with the advanced version of Rockworks, we can create a 3D fault ribbon, such as these uh, 
uh, tilted planes that we see here. And th again, those will be used as barriers to our gridding. Uh, the upper surface, kind of small, but uh, you can check it again when you're creating your own lithology models where we're getting uh, some bleeding here between these values on in the middle and these pink or magenta values here on the right with our fault ribbons. We can uh, use those as barriers so that this particular block does not affect this other block over here. Color uh, solid modeling, again, is for the clay people. Undefined is what do we set our null value to in the model? By default, Rockworks uses our own under, our null value of minus 1 times 10 to the 27th, uh, unlikely to occur in real data, but you may want to combine your model with another program, and you may want to replace those. Instead of using a null value, use a zero value or some other type of value. We'll leave it at the default at minus 1 times 10 to the 27th. So let's start and make a lateral extrusion model of our uh, lithology. So we'll OK out of that. We've chosen all the options. We can limit input values. I'd leave those turned off by default. Now let's go down and look at our 3D diagram options. Once we create a model, we want to see how it came out. So uh, we'll turn on the option to create a 3D diagram on the fly. We don't have to, but we'll go ahead and do that. Um, when we plot our diagram, we can either use one of two methods. One is called full voxel, where the diagram will try to render each of our uh, voxel uh, grid or nodes, uh, cells, I guess I'll call them, in 3D. Or we can just display the midpoint, where we have just points representing the center of each of those cells. Uh, this is a nicer full model. This might be good if we wanted to represent the model as a cloud around some other type of data, like our boreholes. We'll leave that at full voxel for now. We have the option to plot our logs again. In this case, we can truncate them to if we need to. We normally, uh, in your example, I don't think we'll be truncating them. Since we're plotting our logs, we'll define that we want to display lithology in each of our boreholes. We can uh, define how thick we want that cylinder to be. We can do the reference cage here, where we'll draw a box around the 3D solid model. And we can include a legend. We can also add it later. And we can include volumetrics. So I'll turn the legend on and turn off the volumetrics, hit process. And now I'm defining that 3D solid model based on those options that I selected. Happened pretty quick. And here's our results. You can see uh, this purple unit was displayed all the way down to the bottom. In between our lithologic contacts, over here on this east face, you can see we have some pretty blocky contacts between the two types of uh, lithologies that are encountered here. Within that lithology model, we can do some additional slicing. I'll double click on the lithology model to bring up that options dialog box. Let's add a north-south slice about halfway through the model. And then after we draw that slice, let's represent those voxels as points. Hit apply, see what we get. So we're drawing the slice, redrawing the model. Let's change that to points here as well. Apply that. Close. So uh, I popped under. This can happen when it's in three. When you're maximized, you can always grab that uh, window that popped under from your taskbar, which is vertical here on the right. So here's my model displayed displayed as points. Let's. Uh, double click on that. Let's change it to hidden. Oh, I know what happened. Let's, I always skip this step. Let's go back to solid. <laughs> Apply that. Let's, let's draw our slice, north south slice, midway through. I always forget to click on the add slice button. 
So that draw style change to wireframe. Let's just hide it real quick and apply it. So there's the slice that we added through our model. This, and you can see the model points are being drawn as I rotate it. This is a good way to check that our model came out as expected. You can see in this case, we have a lot of this purple unit appearing, probably from this borehole over here, or this one, or perhaps some of these over here. So uh, in addition to these slices, we can draw more controlled uh, panels through a 3D model with a fence diagram, or we can take two dimensional slices through it as cross sections or profiles. So let's go back to the solid and apply that. And we're doing a redraw. We'll close this. And let's take a look at that filtering option that I was talking about earlier. If I double click on that, you can see again I had that filter option here. By default, I have all my lithology values from 1 to 9. I can go in here and say, just show me everything between 4 and 5. Apply that. So now I filtered my model to only show my yellows, my sands and gravels. And, and I also get a volumetric calculation for those units on the fly. Okay, that's our lithology model. Let's keep going. Uh, I can save this model when I'm finished to a Rockpot 3D window. So I can either hit File Save or choose the Save icon, and I'll change. I'll call this one Lithology with Logs. So once I save that model, I can go in and append another type of uh, 3D diagram to that. Say I had separate ones for lithology and stratigraphy. I theoretically could plot those on the same model, but uh, a little bit hard to visualize when they occupy the same space, but still something that would be possible to do. I'll close that and go down to some of our other data types that you may use for displaying your data. That's our interval-based data and point-based data. Interval-based data is numerical data that's gradational between the points. It used to be called geochemistry because geochemical data certainly works that way. But we can add any type of data that has a top and a base and a numerical value. We would do that at the types table here and define that, that type of uh, uh, analyte that we want to add to the table. And it would appear as a new column here in the iData table. While we're in here, we'll, we'll look real quickly at our uh, data entry options. This data is existing in the database table. If, since this is a database, we can only do one cell at a time, so we can't just paste in a bunch of values from Excel. But if we go into a data sheet view, now we do have a multiple cell editing capability. So this might be a good way to come in, go into the bottom of the data set, We'll scroll down. And I could uh, scroll, add some new columns here and then just paste in some new data into these columns. First my depth intervals and then maybe my values and then save those changes. Those would be saved back to the database. I didn't make any changes, so there's nothing apparent here. But just as a reminder, another way to get data in for a single borehole. When we go into the iData menu and choose modeling, in this case, uh, let's, let's just, we'll go, we could also just go to the fence diagram option. We can create a new model on the fly here, but our output diagram will be a fence diagram instead of a solid block model. Our options are, are similar to what we saw previously. Here's some filtering options. Here's our model name, our solid modeling options now. In, additional to, in addition to blending and extrusion, now we have some inverse distance and Krieging options that we can use for those gradational values in between two existing boreholes. So rather than the classification scheme of lithology, where it's either one, a sand, or two, a shale, we could have, if we had two values, uh, one and two, we can have a 1.5 in the middle. 
the option I have selected is uh, anisotropic, where we're again weighting that horizontal distance over the vertical distance. If we had chosen an isotropic method, then there would be no uh, uh, tendency to connect things horizontally. Uh, this might be good for if we were modeling an intrusive or, or a uh, some other type of uh, uh, vertically oriented unit. In addition to anisotropic, we have one called inverse distance weighted advanced. And in this case, we can change our weighting exponents horizontally and vertically. So we could uh, make the vertical thing units uh, further appear further apart by giving them a higher exponent because again it's the inverse distance exponent vertically so this can happen uh, we could we would use this method if we wanted to uh, control some of that anisotropy a little bit more hands-on under Krieging it's not true 3d Krieging but we have a method that we're calling horizontally uh, biased Krieging where again we're preserving that horizontal weighting over the vertical and we can do uh, some uh, Krieging uh, variogram analysis on our data we have in addition to uh, horizontal cutoffs, we also have vertical cutoffs using these methods for interval-based data. And here are our old methods that we use for lithology, blending, extrusion, and probability. So let's start with uh, inverse distance anisotropy. That's the one that's selected. That's the one we'll use. We have a super base filter based on our surface elevations in our boreholes. Everything else is turned off. Looks good. So now when we uh, process that, will create a, uh, a model. We're not going to get a diagram in this case because I didn't define my panels. So let's go back into that menu. Uh, for doing a fence diagram, I can just freeform define where do I want those panels to be drawn. And every time I click twice, I get two panels drawn. I also have some predefined panel patterns. Let's clear those out so I could draw a cross or a plus diagonals or any number of uh, different types of panels. If we draw too much, we won't be able to see what's going on. So let's keep it simple, clear those out. We'll just draw a couple of hand-drawn panels here for our fence. I do have the logs turned on. So I, I can use that to compare my lithology model. Or I'm sorry, we're working on our interval-based model for benzene in 3D. So most of we can see from this model that uh, most of the data values are low as represented by magenta. And we have a single high value here uh, represented with this colored gradient. So that's our fence diagram in 3D. We created a model in much the same way that we did for lithology, but now we have gradational values between the data and we're using this color spectrum or uh, color gradation to represent the values for interval-based data. You may be wondering when we have an interval, what, where does uh, RockWorks look to find that data point? And the answer is it looks in the center of each of these intervals. So in this interval from 0 to 1.5 with a value of 6.1, where is that point located in 3D space? Uh, Rockworks treats this as if it's a single point at halfway in between here at 0 0.75. Uh, let's go down next to point-based data, or we just have a single depth. The same options are going to exist here when we go to P data and do a fence diagram or a cross section. Okay, let's choose a, uh, let's go into the model, the create a new solid model. We'll use the uh, gamma. We'll give that model a name. When we click on that name, we can, uh, go to this file open dialog box to see what other models have been created. 
our solid modeling options are going to be the same as interval data and with these additional uh, lithology-based options as well, just in case we need them. If we were going to create a new model under 3D diagram, we'll have the option to plot a different type of model. Before, uh, our diagram was based on these blocky voxels. Since we have gradational values, we also have the option now to do a so-called isosurface, where we'll just plot a uh, sort of a 3D contour or the onion skin around that, uh, that uh, isosurface value or cutoff. So let's try an isosurface. Say OK and process. So now we're calculating uh, act the actual values through uh, all the 450,000 nodes, except for uh, some of the nodes are being ignored because they are outside our filters, like our surface filter that we created. And here's our progress bar marching along here. Uh, if, you, if we had chosen a, an even higher resolution model, the calculation would be a lot slower. It's not that fast as it is. So uh, here we go. We're almost done. So now we're adding our logs. Here's our 3D uh, solid model for gamma. If we double click on the gamma model over here on the left, we'll get the options dialog box. Now we just have a single filter where, with a cutoff. If we move that filter up a little bit and hit a Let's move it up quite a bit more. So what we're doing is we're drawing an outline around the lowest value that is uh, that low value that's displayed here. We can type in a cutoff value of 50 or, say, uh, 75 and, and apply that. So now only those values above that cutoff are shown. A little bit hard to see in the center of the model anyway. At the edges, we're going to see where it slices through those higher values. So that's our isosurface. And uh, we'll apply that with no cutoff and close. Get that model back. Some of the other options will look familiar, opacity. Uh, we can draw contours along the, uh, the top surface. In this case, it's all one value. But if we had multiple intersections, we can have different colors there. Uh, we can uh, set our color range here. And we can uh, set our opacity. Let's get that back. We can uh, also turn our logs on and off. Here they are behind the model. Each log is broken out separately with the different components. So if we're wondering uh, where is, for instance, drill hole one on this diagram without zooming in and looking for it, we could uh, quickly turn, click it on and off and then uh, that makes it apparent on the model. So a good little trick to use there. So uh, that concludes our uh, modeling discussion for our 3D models. We have interval-based models, point-based models, lithology models, all based on this solid block model uh, component. And then we have our stratigraphy models, which are based on gridded surfaces. If we take a look under our solid models on the program ma project manager here, here's our gamma model that we created and our benzene model and our lithology model. We can double click on those and display them on the fly. Or we can go in through the menu and uh, use the additional options there to display our model. So uh, I think a good this is a good might be a good place to stop and uh, see if we have any questions about the different modeling methods. If you have a question, you can turn on your microphone or your icon 
for your audio and ask the question verbally, or you can type it into the chat window that's on your little GoToMeeting widget that should be floating on your screen. I know it's a lot to absorb in one sitting. I'm recording this session as well so that you will be able to review it. Uh, in addition, uh, don't forget the, this little red uh, help button here. If you click on that and go to contents, double click, pardon me, uh, what you'll get off screen in this case. Let me see if I can grab that and pull it over. Uh, the Rockworks help jumps up or is displayed in your browser. This is my Chrome browser here, so there's a lot of help and tutorials about all these different methods. We also have the videos as well. If you, uh, we just finished a uh, presentation at a hotel where the internet was a little bit sketchy. So if uh, you, you're going to be someplace where the internet's not available, you can go into your preferences here under general program preferences for the help system and say, I'd like you to download the help to a particular folder. And you can dis you can designate that folder name here, either put it in uh, the Rockworks, oh, here we go, off screen. You can put it in a particular folder or in your documents, for instance, or specify a new folder. And then you can click and download uh, all the help messages in, in a zip file and use those offline when you're not connected to the internet. So I think that the, the if you're going to be most interested in modeling the types of uh, rock that you saw down hole, there the ash, the avalanche debris. Uh, other types of methods of, of, of units. I think the big question you, you probably that I have after only seeing one data point, uh, one borehole with the data is uh, graphically anyway, is uh, which would be the best way to model this data? Should I do it as lithology or should I do it as stratigraphy? So my answer to that is uh, try both methods and see which one gives you the most realistic model. Lithology is going to model it as a block, and you'll have to use lithology if you have repeated units down hole. If you happen to have it where you have orders preserved between all your units, they're always in the same order, and they're never repeated, then stratigraphy might be a good way to go because we can use gridded surfaces to represent the data. Lithology is going to have a very strong horizontal weighting or bias. So if you feel like your units change elevation quite a bit, then stratigraphy might be a better way to go. And if you, uh, th so there's pluses and minuses between these different types of methods. Do I use gridded surfaces? Do I use solid block models? It's it's hard to say, it's impossible to say without looking at your data. So I would take you back to the beginning uh, procedures or that we discussed or workflows where I would uh, get, take a look at my strip logs maybe in 3D. So let's say if I have everything displayed as lithology, I'll, I'll display this on screen, zoom into a, a few areas and see how continuous are my units here? Uh, do I have any repeated units? Uh, if so, then I definitely, like this unit, green unit here is repeated with a darker green unit in the middle. Lithology is definitely the way to go for this particular model, though it's going to be a little bit blocky. If I go back to my strip log designer and say, show me stratigraphy instead, I'll process that, and this is a simplified view maybe of my data, but I can see a little bit more of a 3D distribution. I see this blue unit is pinching out here uh, between the yellow and the brown unit. I'm not seeing any repeats, then I think I'm safe to work with stratigraphy for doing my modeling.
So we've got some extra time. Uh, let's see. We have a question in the chat box. Let's, uh, it's from Renee. I'm scrolling down to take a look. Renee writes, you discussed modeling with a bias, and we had material come north off the mountain, then some went west, some went east, how to get that bias. Well, I think this is, uh, there's, uh, there's several options that you can use here. I know when we're gridding as stratigraphy, I think that we would introduce a directional weighting to our data so that uh, by uh, adding this bias, we'll say units that are east and west connected in, on, in the east-west line are probably going to be more connected than units in the north-south direction. So under my stratigraphy and model, if we go to interpolate surfaces, there it is, and go to options, I have these directional methods where I can say I want to introduce a directionality in either the uh, 90 or 270 direction. Looks like I have to scroll through here. Oh, I have to turn it on first. So I could say I want a 90 degree bias. So that would be an easterly bias. I can have it bi-directional or unidirectional where I'll only have it look in one direction. So this might be one way to introduce some bias to your gridding. I don't think I would start here. I think I would do it without that weighting to begin with to see what type of a model you get. And then if you do find that it's not uh, representing the actual units on the ground, then we can go into some of this directional bias. Let's take a look in 3D, see what our options are in lithology. Go to lithology and model. Under create a new model, modeling options, here as well, we don't have any of that uh, directionality that we had in some of our other types of modeling. So that, you might feel that that is a detriment for this type of modeling. But uh, we do have filtering, but we don't have any directionality to the lithology modeling. Let's go to one other type of model, iData modeling or interval-based modeling where you have a top and a base. Here's our solid modeling options. With these advanced options here, some of these may have some, especially Krieging, would have the option for doing some directionality where we would calculate on the fly which points are more alike and which are different based on our variogram modeling. If you haven't done anything with geostatistics, you might just keep it automatic, but um, if you have worked with that before, you might want to take a look at your, your variograms. Let's try that real quick. We'll use automatic. With manual, we could actually specify these parameters, the granularity of our model. Let's, let's make a, instead of examining them all, let's just look at them all in a matrix and process. So this will take a little bit. This might have been better done with 2D modeling for demonstration purposes, but Krieging it will calculate variograms in the various directions to help us see where things are more alike and where things are different to see if that fabric is represented in your data. So we're about three quarters of the way done. We'll just let it continue. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of a report at the end here. There's, let's see, here it popped off on the other screen. Let's drag it out. So you can see with this particular data set, using very, we just used a number of different variogram methods. And you can see with uh, this particular one is the one that was selected as best fitting our data, even though the points are a little bit scattered. We're seeing a very strong east-west directionality here, but even some of our other methods are, mirror, are supporting that uh, effort, even though the directionality is, is slightly varied here. But I would, I would looking at this Krieging uh, matrix report, it's reporting that it's seeing a very strong continuity east-west and a little bit more variation north-south. 
So uh, that, and then it, it's using that directionality or weighting when it created our lithology model. Here, this one is benzene. Let's drag that off and do a little bit of a filter. So uh, it's a little bit less of a filter. You can see here's uh, our model. There's really just one high point that I'm aware of on this model, not shown with these particular logs, but I'm, I'm seeing from a top-down approach, I'm seeing some of that directionality extended out from my data set in the east-west direction. So that's, that's kind of a quick answer to your directional weighting or bias. And uh, uh, definitely worth looking at. I, I don't think you should settle for any one of these modeling methods. One thing that drives me crazy is one of our other instructors will come in and say, as soon as we start looking at modeling, everything is bogus. Well, I don't think it's quite bogus per se. I think, you know, you do have to realize we're stepping away from our actual data set and using mathematical algorithms to calculate data in between our data points. And uh, it's up to us as uh, geologists and engineers familiar with the area to make sure that the calculated model matches what we know about the area. So uh, like you knew about that east-west bias or weighting in your data from the way it was deposited, we don't, the Rockworks doesn't know about that ahead of time, but you can use these methods to have it query the data and extract some of those uh, uh, directional weighting from the actual data. Hmm. And, and, and if there's any other questions, jump right in, no problem. Um, really, uh, as far as um, uh, I'm thinking for your data, the first thing you need to do is start getting your data into the program. So whether you use the Excel method where you enter the data into an Excel sheet like the one we use, or you, or you start pasting things into the data sheet on a borehole by borehole basis, uh, get that data into the program and start looking at it graphically and start trying to get an idea of the continuity of the data throughout the project area and the distribution of the data vertically. Do you have these repeats or do you have um, uh, just a uniform order to the data? Uh, Renee, we did talk a little bit about in 2D about some of the things that we can do with our logs. If you are working with SPT data, most of the time I just see that being displayed on a log. So what I've done is I've gone into the strip log menu, chosen 2D, chosen 2D and a single log. Let's get that back up here. So I can do some rudimentary strip logs with my data. If it's if I if it's in one of these I data or P data tables, I can turn that on and display it uh, as a series of bar graphs. Uh, in addition, I can put in uh, values that would occur. Um, I have to always search for that particular option. But oh, here it is under text. I put this cartoon just gives me a graphical look at how my data are distributed. Uh, within the strip log, these, these aren't my actual data values, but it's just showing the order of the columns. So I can say I don't need that particular bar graph, but it would be nice to have columns of values. Then I can go in and put in a value for the blow counts, for uh, other, other types of just graphical data that you don't care to model, but you want to display it on individual logs. This is a good way to go in and, and look at your data as well. Well, I, I am cutting it off a little bit early, seeing as I have a commitment in 15 minutes, and I apologize for that. We did run a little bit late last time, but if you feel that you would like another session, I'd be willing to throw in another 30-minute session after you've digested some of this data. But realistically, the best way to discuss what's happening will be to get your data into the database, uh, save it, 
look at it in 2D and 3D, and if you have any questions, send me a copy of that database, and I'll be able to look at what you're looking at, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer questions over the phone and, or through a web meeting, but really my preferred method is via email because, uh, let's face it, uh, answering things on the fly, you're just going to get my quick answer off the top of my head. Sometimes that's even the right answer. Sometimes it's not, though. And if I have time to take a look at your data in depth, come up with a, an answer, all that will be included. Uh, when you, when you get the program, we have free email support. Even before you, you buy the program, you're welcome to continue to use the evaluation copies that you have. If you have a purchase coming up in the near future, we'll be happy to extend your evaluation period for another two weeks after it expires um, so you can start working with your data. And once you buy it, you won't lose any of the work that you've done with the evaluation copies. It's all the same program. The only difference between the trial version and the full version is that the full version doesn't expire. It comes with a year of maintenance so that you will get new versions of the program as we put them out for a full year. After that, you're welcome to continue using whatever version you're, you're at when the maintenance expires. Or, of course, we'll send you some reminders in case you do want to extend that maintenance. It's 15% uh, per year, and that will get you new versions uh, as they come out, new bug fixes, etc. So if there are no further questions, I will go ahead and end our session for today. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been a pleasure uh, working with you so far and answering your questions. I look forward to additional questions via email. You can just send them to our general email box, support at rockware.com. That way, if I'm out of the office, somebody else will pick it up and answer your questions. Um, typically, uh, you can call, but we typically say, well, gee, can you send me your project so I can see your data? We usually have to take a look at the real data to answer any of those questions. Uh, all that email support is included with your evaluation period as well as with the full license. So thank you again. Uh, I look forward to working with you. It looks like an interesting project. I hope I can look at some of your data and uh, help you evaluate what's going on and what's the best way to model your data. But everybody, take care. Have a great day. Uh, you're welcome to email me any questions uh, after the session ends. I will post a uh, final link to the YouTube recording. It's just a rough recording of uh, Un unfiltered, unedited of uh, everything that uh, we've been discussing today, and you're welcome to use that indefinitely. So thanks again, everybody. Take care and have a great day.